two things that I try to avoid doing on this channel. I don't start beef with other YouTubers, and I try not to get too butthurt when people have opinions that are different from my own. <sighs> but several years ago, one of my favorite content creators posted a video which has bothered me quite a lot. I don't know. In all honesty, the idea only had possibility for one movie, and even then, it wasn't really that much possibility. They just kind of got lucky in how goofy it was. Again, Bruce Campbell driving Herbie. Just watching him talk to the car is kind of funny. But really, that's just kind of a kitsch thing. Like, oh, isn't it funny if you know who Bruce Campbell is and know what Herbie is to see them together talking? But yeah, that's not really enough to make it last throughout an entire movie. What? Okay, so straight up, when I was a kid, I worshipped the 1997 Love Bug remake. I was a huge Herbie Holic, I saw them all over and over again on VHS, and the 1997 film was the one that I appreciated the most out of the bunch. It was something special that I held very close to my heart. So it kinda hurts to sit back and hear a content creator that I respect so much state out loud, unironically, over and over again, that the literal only noteworthy thing about the product that I loved so much was that Bruce Campbell is in it, and that Bruce Campbell was in another film that also featured a car that was alive. Look, Doug, we get it. You love cars too. It's your favorite movie. But not all of us can view every film that we ever see throughout our entire lives as a comparison to the Cars franchise. Over the years, though, the more I considered this, the more I started to wonder if the film really was as good as my memory had told me that it was. My mind wandered to Space Jam, a film that came out the year I was born, but I never actually saw growing up. I've heard a lot of criticisms about the film from older viewers and people who didn't grow up with it, but from my experience, people who did grow up watching it won't accept even the slightest suggestion that the film is anything less than my generation's Citizen Kane. Perhaps there is the slightest chance that my admiration for the 1997 Love Bug film branches entirely from the fact that it is something that I am nostalgically attached to. The fact that so many people have less than stellar things to say about the film can't boil down to everyone I disagree with being out of touch. I'm not afraid to look back on things that I once liked and admit that they might have been a little bit stupid. Look at my old haircuts, for instance. What the fuck was I thinking? So I wanted to sit down and figure out exactly what was really so bad about this film. Keywords are wanted to. Because I tried. Oh, I tried. I gave it my best, 110%. And I just don't get it. What do you guys not like about this movie? Stellar acting that creates realistic and hilarious characters, a story that actually has an interest on the central concepts that it is putting forth, the foresight to realize how to bridge the gap between the originals while still putting a new twist on it all, interesting directing, satisfying music, what is there to hate? The film starts off with a flashback recapping the basic ideas that had been set up in the original set of films, narrated by the late Dean Jones. He was a daring little car, wild, willing to try almost anything. All for the love of his owner, Jim Douglas. We flash forward to the present day, where Herbie is in a car show being driven by a man named Simon Moy III. Moore comes in last in the race, which is a great annoyance to him as he had specifically sought out this car due to its previous history in racing. I mean, I don't understand. I mean, this is the Jim Douglas car. It's the one you asked for. It's the one that won all those races. Hey, so it's Moore is about pissed about the failure that he had just experienced in the race, and has Herbie towed off to the junkyard to await eternity. We get to some sort of gas station repair combo where we see our main character, Hank Cooper, played by the lovely Bruce Campbell, goofing off and watching a race. He's caught by his boss, who pulls him out to yell at him about his work ethic. This is coming out of your paycheck, Hank. 
No, this is your paycheck. It wasn't even a good race. I mean, come on, Rudy Walters. I used to race circles around guys like Walt. I think they called that spinning out. The whole scene is clearly just a setup to dump a whole lot of character exposition on us. And it constantly steers ever so close to being a bit too obvious about the fact that that is what it's doing. But it still stays just far enough away from the road marks that I never found it too grating. We're also introduced to our main side character, Roddy. Roddy will narratively serve the role as the first person who figures out that Herbie is alive. In previous films, these characters have usually been cast to be bright and doughy and fun, but in this one he is specifically put in the role because he constantly looks bad shit insane. He's alive! The shop owner tells Hank that he's entered him into a racing competition since he does so little around the shop, and that if he doesn't enter, he will be fired. Then you're gonna be a washed up mechanic, as well as a washed up driver. See what I love about the exposition? From that line, I've already figured out that Hank, at some point, was a driver. The line was clearly put there just so I would figure this out, and yet it's written in such a way that it sounds like an insult that I would dish out at someone if I were pissed at them. Sometime later, Hank and Roddy await the car show as the racers ahead of them choose their own cars to fix up. Apparently this is some sort of fixer-up car show, wherein mechanics pick out junkers based entirely on outward appearance and then race to see who can finish a lap first. Now, hold on a second. If this is a competition against mechanics, why are they all working on different cars? How can you compete against other mechanics when you're all working on different cars? Number two, where are you? Don't this is a your joke, car. man. What? What just happened? I watched this film with a friend to prepare for this review, and what I found was that every time they tried to point out a plot hole, the film would almost immediately address it seconds after he had voiced his concerns. This, however, is an inherent problem not for the film, but for me, as an internet reviewer because picky bullshit nonsense is where I get 90% of my comedic material. So yeah, sorry if this one's a little bit dry, guys. I'm trying my best. Roddy points out that it's sad to see no one picking Herbie, saying that he feels bad for the car. Hank decides to pick Herbie himself, despite knowing that he has no chance of winning if he does this. The light sentimental music in this scene suggests that Hank chooses Herbie because he feels bad for it, but the dialogue directly afterwards suggests that it's actually because he just wanted to fuck with his boss. All you said was I had to enter. I like him. Hank and Roddy start working on repairing Herbie's engine, eventually resulting in this odd moment. I think he said the distributor. That's what it sounded like. Oh, did it now. Well, the distributor's cracked. Even as a kid, I thought this was stupid, for Roddy to take the distributor from that basic honk. I at one point considered the possibility that at some stage of production or writing, Herbie actually had dialogue. But now that I am grown up enough to pick up on underlying motifs and cues, I think we're supposed to believe that some people can just understand what Herbie is saying. He spoke to me. He spoke to me too, Doc. <laughs> I guess that makes sense with some of the characters being able to argue and talk with the car in full, but it's still a bit of an odd concept, I suppose, and you likely wouldn't pick up on it on your first time through. I think most people would immediately reconcile Roddy as criminally insane from the get-go, since he's already talking to the car and everything, but I actually kind of find it charming. You're gonna be okay. Just need a little help. Little TLC. Yeah. That's the sort of thing that I do to cars and pets and stuff. J just talk to them and say nice things, even when I know that they're not listening. It's not exactly the sort of thing that you'll find on charts on how to write good main characters, but on that note, I think it's fine for him to be a little sporadic and eccentric. So they set up for the race and prepare to head off. All three of the judges for the race have some sort of important bearing on the plot. Simon is, of course, the racer we saw at the start of the film. The second judge is an owner of some sort of organization that does custom bodywork. And the third judge, Alex, is a writer for a racing magazine as well as the ex of Hank. Know her? 
dated her. Alex is, I find, a pretty well-rounded character. Too often these films either have female characters who are obviously underwritten because of the time that the film was made in, or ones that are purposefully overwritten in the fact that they are women and thus strong and independent. In either instance, there rarely is anything to talk about with them other than the fact that they are indeed of the female variety. This character, meanwhile, at least has some base interests and personality that are irrelevant to her gender and make her seem a bit more real. Sure, later on in the film, there are still a few cringe-worthy moments of the writers trying to poke fun at previous standards for women in film, but overall, when I watch this film, I never feel like Alex is a symbol before she's a person. So the race starts off, and it seems like Team Herbie is out for the count. But that doesn't last long, as Herbie takes off so fast that he makes a wheelie and turns into 1990s 3D animation. Yeah, there's a reason that Toy Story stuck to toys, uh, but again, this is a 1997 movie. I think that it's harsh to judge these effects too critically. While it does indeed make Herbie look like a rubber bath toy, a lot of the effects past this fact are impressive, and the integration is near flawless. It's hard to explain, I guess, but even if I do always feel like this is an effect, I also always feel like the car is actually there. It's very physical in nature. It teeters the line of suspension of disbelief next to knowledge that this is, in fact, a film. Speaking of Toy Story, throughout the entire film, Bruce Campbell constantly sounds like he's doing a Woody impression. Well, all right. Let's go! Now let's catch up to that truck! Oh! Herbie and Hank obviously win the race and are the buzz of the event. While one of the judges seems to take his victory as a sign that he is at least a good mechanic, the others are extremely skeptical. The theme of Hank being annoyed that no one will believe that winning the race was the fruit of his own efforts is a major theme in the film and pops up constantly. People wanting to give Herbie the credit when he feels like he deserves the limelight is something that he constantly bickers about. It's brought up a lot, but I wish they'd given it a bit more of a clear payoff. We keep getting brief snippets of the history of Hank's life before the start of the film, most specifically on the topic of his life of racing and his relationship with Alex. When meeting with Simon, it's brought up that they both competed in the same races, but Simon has no idea who he is and has never heard of him. We could take this as Simon just being an all-around bag, or we could take it to be that despite his talents, Hank wasn't very recognized in the racing industry. After a long series of circumstances, which end in Herbie driving Alex and Hank to the middle of nowhere and locking them in so they have to talk about their problems, Hank is forced to explain why he broke up with Alex, which boils down to the fact that she could only ever talk about racing. More specifically, he started to view spending time with her as a constant reminder of previous failures. Let me give you a little dating tip. Never blow off women who show an interest in what you do. An interest? Now, wait a minute. You brought up every every crash I had, every blown engine, every mischief you threw my entire failed career at me. These fervent discussions of Hank giving up on things that he used to love and care about feel like they should be building up to some sort of obvious payoff moment. You keep expecting some sort of big scene where Hank finally fesses up and stares off into the distance as he tells some depressing flashback story about why he quit. You know, the sort of thing that every sports movie has to do. But we really never get this sort of scene, and I'm kind of split on if I like that or not. The way the film is written, the leading characters are sort of non-conformist in terms of how films usually go. To have some sort of dumb big moment where, where, where Hank stares a little past the camera but not directly into it, and suddenly flickers to black and white, uh, well, it would be a very movie thing to happen. Okay, so the Herbie universe isn't exactly the most realistic one to choose from, but there is a clear contrast between having moments and ideas that are more fantastical and having your characters be written in a totally transparent movie context. One that removes all plausibility for those things being real, so they can instead make it a little easier on the script writers. The transformation of how he changes throughout the film isn't obvious at first, but I almost feel like it's better that way. The movie thing to happen would be for the character's transformation to be that he feels like he doesn't get enough credit, and then he eventually gets that credit alongside major fame. But in this film, I suppose the transformation is that he doesn't feel like he gets enough credit and fame, 
And then he realizes that he only got to where he was due to the work of other people, slash sentient cars, and he suddenly stops being a giant man-child about everything. Before the scene where the two are locked in the car, we get this short gag scene wherein they stop at a red light and end up next to one of those newfangled spring-loaded cars that went out of style a long time ago but are still kind of cool to watch. And Herbie tries to impersonate one of them. <laughs> Clearly stupid, kinda dates it a lot, but pfft. The most important thing is that this is what sends Simon over the edge, deciding that he has to figure out the secrets behind Herbie once and for all. Something that I appreciate about this film is that the entire plot basis is entirely centered around the existence of Herbie in this universe. If you're a diehard Herbie fan, this might annoy you as this breaks the basic structure of the early films. And if you're someone who isn't really into the Lovebug films, you likely don't know what I'm talking about. Lovebug films treated the character of Herbie in the same way that they would the Three Stooges or any other classic gag characters of old. You're there to see your favorite characters wander into goofy situations that have little to actually do with them. Do you want to see a movie where the Three Stooges meet a witch who hates them and she creates a set of evil Stooges who they have to battle throughout the rest of the film and it gets real serious? No, no, you don't want to see that. You want to see the Stooges just wander into other people's movies and mess everything up. But on that note, the classic difference between Herbie and the Stooges is clear. Herbie is an explicitly unique idea that wouldn't be normal to see in the real world. The fact, for instance, that Herbie films so often use the reveal that Herbie is alive as a gag scene before an actual plot point shows that they were at least a bit disconnected from their own universe. A car being alive is pretty weird to say the least, and it needs exploring in full. 